Hello, my name is Michelle, and you're listening to Profit is a Choice. On the podcast today is Nicole Heimer, the founder of Curio Electro, which is a boutique creative agency specializing in intuitive branding, compelling design, and actionable strategy. She has had her own agency since 2011, and she works with a wide variety of clients at every stage in their development. Her niche, however, is interior design firms. Today, we're going to talk about branding. Starting our conversation will be a definition of branding, and then we get right into why it is important, how it should show up, and how profitability can be impacted with terrific and not so terrific branding. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as Nicole and I enjoyed talking with each other. Every day, empowered entrepreneurs are taking ownership of their company financial health and enjoying the rewards of reduced stress and more creativity. With my background as a financial software developer, owner of multiple businesses in the interior design industry, educator and speaker, I coach women in the interior design industry to increase their profits, regain ownership of their bottom line, and to have fun again in their business. Welcome to Profit is a Choice. Hey, Nicole, welcome to Profit is a Choice. I'm so glad you're with me today. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much. You are welcome. So, Nicole, both of us are going to um, be spending some time together, and we're doing the Luann Nagara Live. It's about the conversation event, which is at the end of March, beginning of April, and we are both co-authors in her second book that's coming out. So exciting. I know, isn't it, doesn't it sound fun? And I, I want everybody to come join us at the live event if you can. Um, I, I really think it's going to be an event like no other. It, it's completely different than a lot of the other conferences and all that we've seen. It's, I would say, two and a half days of complete learning. I know Peter Lang and I talked about it in um, a prior conversation, but even as authors, we know that we're going to be learning while we're there. Oh, yeah. I, I'm really excited to, to meet all of you guys in person. And also, I agree, the format is so interesting that she's put together. And, you know, anybody who knows Luann's stuff knows that she doesn't. I think the big thing about her with moderating, you know, all of these all of these panels is that she doesn't let things slip through the cracks. You know, like if anyone says anything that needs clarification, Luann will not let you go <laughs> until <laughs> you clarify it. Um, but yeah, so it's a nice combination of um, the people who know about a thing, you know, so in my case, branding and in your case, profit and pricing and social media and all these, you know, really important things. And then she's got um, in, an interior designer with on the same panel talking about, you know, living it, like doing the actual thing. So it's just really cool. It is different. Yeah, and, and the opportunity to ask questions live. So yes. I agree with you. We, we need more of Luann's just in our normal um, reporting around the country, right? Who lets nothing get by. We need more of her, oh my gosh, her right? style. But what's going to be <laughs> so cool is she's going to ask questions like she always does. It's like watching a live podcast, really. But mm -hmm. then there's also audience participation where they get to ask questions and they get to talk to the speakers. You know, the speakers are not going to be the authors are not going to be running away and hiding in our rooms. We're going to be right there with everybody. That's mm -hmm. pretty cool to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah. So, all right, everybody, we're going to move in to talk about branding, but we just want you to know we're super excited. We want you super excited. So sign up and come see us. Um, if you're looking for a link for that, you can head over to scarletthreadconsulting.com and it is right in the banner at the top. It says, join Michelle at Luann Nagara Live, and then you can come see us. Okay. So Nicole, tell me a little bit about your business today. Um, sure. Um, my business today. Well, so I started in 2011 um, and, uh, you know, I started as a uh, garden variety web designer back then. You know, um, my background is in graphic design. I have a BFA in illustration, so that's my formal training. And um, I went back and got a certification to learn how to code. And my first client was an interior designer, like the very first website that I built. And things have grown over the past eight years. And um, now we do, you know, um, copywriting. You know, our, our main thing is, is really helping um, companies to brand themselves, to find what is unique, interesting, memorable, to say something about who they are. And then we translate that into... Uh, 
design and development into creating a dis digital destination for people to go and buy their services. And then we have other, other things that go along with that, like you know, marketing automation and all of that kind of thing. Um, but we mostly work with interior designers at this point. I love that. A digital destination. <laughs> Fancy. I don't think, yeah, I don't think I've ever heard of that before. I need to start thinking of my website as the digital destination that I have for you. <laughs> um, join us. I know, right? That's pretty cool, though. I like, I like that term. I'm going to have to write that one down. <laughs> well, thank you. So um, how did you get that first client? I mean, I know you said that they happened to be an interior designer. Was it just like by chance that that was the first person that hired you? Did you seek out? maybe another creative, you know, very much what you do is very creative based. Did you seek out another creative to build the website for, or, or was it just kind of a, just a, a you know, a, a meeting that wasn't planned? Uh, so it was someone that I worked for previously as an office manager. So it was a person that I knew in real life. And I was like, all right, this is, I'm, this is a thing that I'm going to do. Um, hey, would you like me to do this for you? And I charged her, you know, not a lot because it was my first one. Sure. And um, that, that I, I tell this story all the time because it's it's amazing. Like so, it's Sandra of House of Funk, and she she is still a client of mine to this day, eight years later, and she has grown immensely in that time, as have we. And um, I, I will tell you, the funny part is, um, it took I don't know years, years of just to getting one interior design client after another. My third client was an interior designer, probably my fifth client was an interior designer. You know, we serve other types of uh, businesses, but it took me ages to get over whatever weird fear comes with, you know, niching for whatever reason and embrace it and, and say, wow, like I've really built um, experience in this area and I, I know how, you know, the day-to-day -day of an interior designer, and I know what it takes to, to sell their services and to brand them and to really embrace it. So when, I, when I'm working with clients who are like, like, I get, I get it. I get how it can be scary. I don't know why <laughs> um, to embrace specificity. I, I understand it because I went through it myself. That, I think that is so um, interesting. I did the same thing. Um, really? Even though, like, I had owned a drapery workroom with, I would say, interiors based around fabric, right? So textile interiors. I did that for 16 years. And then when I started the, the coaching and consulting business back in 2013, I knew I really wanted to help in this industry. I mean, I knew this was the industry that I knew that I'd been in for so long. However, there's this fear that if I focus too much, even though you, there, you, know, you hear the term all the time, there's riches in the niches, mm -hmm. um, niche, niche, however we choose to say it. I but like people like niche. Sorry. Yeah, that's right. You can say it any way you want. Yes. <laughs> um, but but you, know, you do hear that, that that's where the money is made because of the focus. And then you've got some that'll swear they can't focus on anything. But I, it was funny. I tried at the beginning if I could say to put one toe in the water of focusing, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, sure. like trying to not limit myself, but almost kind of like, yes, this is my, my niche, but not really. And so <laughs> <laughs> right? because of the fear I, and I, yeah. so I recognize exactly what you're saying, that fear of what if I am limiting my ability? And, and I have found that at least for me, it has done quite the opposite. Oh, and, yeah. and I think that's what you're saying as well, because I knew the industry like you. I had I had owned a company in that industry. I had taught in that industry. I've spoken in the industry all the way back since 2007. So I was not new to any of it. I had lived it, breathed it. I'd had the mistakes. I'd had the errors. So, you know, I it wasn't new to me. And I don't think I even appreciated the amount of expertise I had in the industry until I really sat back and learned to focus on, you know, one set of ideas and rules within an industry, if you will, because the same way that you are intimately familiar with interior design from a branding and marketing standpoint, meaning, you know, not only what they do, you know, the voice that they need to have, you also know the pain points of their clients. So that because you know all of that, it is much easier for you to guide them. I think we also have this idea that business has to be hard. 
and <laughs> and that yeah. it's almost like this is too simple, you know, and so therefore I should have more pain and torture in my day to day life. So I should open this up to other areas. But I found that the more I worked across industries, not saying I don't, I do still have clients outside of the interior design industry, but they are very carefully accepted and chosen, right? Yes. Because I do know and understand their industry. But I wouldn't go out and say, hey, I'd like to be the financial coach for the pipe fitting community. Like, I don't, I agree, we need pipe fitters in the world, but I don't really, that's not an industry that I'm like in love with. So that would right. not be my jam. And, and I, I've made peace with that. But I hear you, girl, this idea of the fear of what if I narrow down. And I would say that our designers have this um, workrooms, drapery workrooms, upholsters, all of this. We have this fear of what if I go too narrow? Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. It, it is really, um, it's fascinating. I think, uh, like in hindsight, of course, once you make that jump, you're like, whoa, I mean, the benefits are, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's crazy. You, you have a deeper knowledge. You can become, I mean, talking about profit, you, you can become more profitable because you have so much, you can build efficiency and you can't do that when you're learning new industries every time you take on a client you can't build efficiency you can't put together a package of services that is crafted around the needs of a particular client or you know like whatever whatever the niche is whatever the the messaging point that you're using um so yeah it's once you do it it, it just makes all the sense in the world um but yeah it's, it's funny it's funny that there's this fear around it when like the facts are there you know like <laughs> it just there are so many pros right did you realize, you know, kind of in hindsight, that that meant you really had to work on your own brand voice to continue? People we're going to niche, right? Yes, yes. So, I mean, I think <laughs> there's a funny thing that's happened um, recently. Like, we've gotten uh, quite a few, not quite a few, like a few clients who want copywriting services, you know, usually with paired with other services where they want, where they are interior designers who have kind of a, um, not necessarily like ha ha funny brand voice, but you know, there's a little bit of humor injected into it. And, you know, to my copywriter, I'm like, this is like our, our sub niche, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, but we, we have a, we purposely keep it, you know, me, my assistant, my contractors, um, we keep it light you know, and we try and have that voice through the blog posts and through the emails that our clients receive and all of that kind of stuff. And once we really made that more consistent, we, I mean, I can tell you for sure, Michelle, that we attracted clients who were on the same page. We continue to attract clients that just fit well with us. I mean, it's really something. It's fabulous. I, I agree. I, I want to break that down just one second. And, then, you know, it may be a great segue as we move into branding. But on my side of the coaching with the finances and all, it, it's so funny. And I shared this with you prior to hitting record that, you know, quite often I will have in, people in the interior design industry call me and tell me that they have a pricing or a profit issue. You know, like I'm not making it. Here, here's the way it comes out. They don't say it like that. They say, I am working way too hard for the money I'm making. Or, oh my gosh, I'm looking at the bottom of my profit and loss statement that my accountant slash bookkeeper gave me. And I don't know where that money is. I didn't make that money. I don't know where that money went. Or that number is way too low. You know, that's the way it comes across. And what's so interesting is I, when we get on the call and we start working, they think that we're going to start working on math, like get out your calculator. And, and, and sometimes we do. But quite often, we start walking backwards. And what I find is there is an identity crisis. They're having an identity crisis. They are trying to be all things to all people all the time, and they're nobody to no one. Uh -huh. Right? Yeah. And that shows up in the number on their profit and loss statement. And so when I say, okay, we need to go back and work on your foundation, I get a lot of pushback, like I'm wasting their time, right? Not always, but they're like, I've already done that. I did that like four years ago. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just revisit it. Let's go back and think about this again. Who are you? What are your strengths? What do you like to do? What do you not like to do? What is your why? What is your mission? What is your vision? And so when we start walking back through that, we realize that what's happened is they're offering products and services, packages, if you will, 
to people they don't even like doing things they don't like to do. And then they're wondering why they're not making money. And so when we can start to get everything in alignment, it, it really makes sense. Like you said, really understanding who Nicole was and who your team was. And yes, we're going to work with interior designers, but we're going to do it with a, in a lighthearted way. You know, we're not going to take ourselves so seriously. And then knowing who you were there allowed you to kind of spread out and, and, and kind of perform your magic, right? With all those who would be drawn to that approach. And our, yeah. our designers and our workrooms and our upholsterers can do the exact same thing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when, so just because we have a, a lighter approach and a lighter way of, of just kind of communicating with our clients, we can then work with said client on creating whatever voice makes sense for them. You know, um, right. for some people, it's more aspirational. For some people, it is more down to earth, you know, and, and we can craft that for them and whatever makes sense, whatever makes sense for them. So yes, it is magic. <laughs> it is magic. Really knowing who we are and not being fearful. I think some of the fear comes into, at least on the last couple of discovery calls I've had over the last two weeks, is this idea that we can have, if we're not careful, that we, we've, you know, we've been listened to so many podcasts across all industries. We've read books. We've seen what other designers or professionals are doing, and we think that's what we need to do and so you know there's this creation without thinking about who the owner of the business is mm -hmm. and so that is you know we have to go back and build businesses that support how we were created and where we're talented and strong i just i I'd like i'm not trying to build a business in my weakness that makes me miserable and and we have some people out there that feel this have to have versus i get to have mm -hmm. yeah so, Nicole, when you started your business and you went out on your own, did you plan for profitability from the beginning? And how did you define profit at that point? Or was it just like, let me go create and we'll see how, we'll just hope this all turns out well in the end. Oh, yeah. You know what's great about, uh, about starting a, essentially, I mean, at the time I was a freelancer for all real purposes, right? And sure. what's uh, sarcasm great about being a freelancer is that you can totally undercharge because you have no, like, there's no one to stop you from undercharging. So, no, I did not plan for profit, profit, yeah, yeah, profitability from the very beginning. Um, when, because I had, you know, no real overhead to speak of and I was doing everything myself in, you know, that first year, um, no, I wasn't thinking in those terms. I just, I charged an hourly rate and it was, uh, I would work. And then if it went out of scope, I would just, you know, it all worked out to be not that great. And <laughs> it, it, took, <laughs> it took a little bit of time. Those are the lessons that, you know, some of us, not everyone, I suppose, has to learn. <laughs> right. So. I would say it's very normal within um, entrepreneurial circles, though. In Profit First, we call it entrepreneurial poverty. Mm, yeah. Right. Because we want to work for the passion of what it is we're doing and building, sometimes without and I'm not saying that those first couple of years, you don't have to invest a lot and do a lot. That's not what I'm saying at all. But really without even an eye towards the profitability that we need to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, a t it's, it's a balance, right? Because I mean, even to this day, right? Like if we chart, if we do a lot of flat fee, we, you know, mm -hmm. quote something and then, and then we execute on it. And if we, pr you know, give someone a quote and then it turns out that we are, you know, mm -hmm under under quoting it um we're that's not the client's problem you know like if we quoted it we're doing it right and i can right. say a lesson for the next time um just try not to learn those lessons you know too many times <laughs> before we actually I, take action on it sure and i think the lesson there is it's a lesson for the next time which exactly. means it's not really an error a mistake if you learn right. from it and you can um adjust what's going forward but when oh my gosh, can I just tell you? I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, so not in, in my newer office space, although it's been like a year, I haven't put this up yet, but in my previous office space, I had this just good, like written um, in like wood letters that hung up on the wall to, as a reminder of that. So the idea being like, oh my gosh, like we just launched a site and like everything freaking broke, you know, like, you know, like there were like a whole bunch of technical errors that happened. Sure. All right. Good, good. Now we know for next time that we have to look out for this, this, and this. Or like we underquote it. Okay, good. Now we know to look for this, this, and this because that has to be the mindset. It has to be. 
I mean, it has to be yeah. because what you're paying attention to is what you get to solve and fix. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like, we're not, it's not okay to say like, I'm not going to look at my branding. I know it's not working. Nobody gets me. I always say, you know, are other people picking up what you're putting down? So if you mm -hmm. keep telling me that you are attracting the wrong client, it's not the client's fault. What, what bait are you fishing with? Are you even fishing in the right pond? Like, mm -hmm. right? Don't yeah. be in freshwater if you totally are going after a saltwater fish. You're in the wrong place. Move, yeah. change your bait. And and so it's the same thing. You've got to look at what you're trying to attract and then ask if your message is there. If you want your finances to work out, you've got to look at them. Like we've got to look at these things if we want to be profitable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and as far as the branding goes, I mean, it, it's it's uh, so much of the time with interior design. This is part of the reason why I really um, started exploring the branding hardcore because of course, you know, visual branding, that's basically where I started. That's where my training is. But the, um, the messaging part of it just became super, super interesting to me because in the interior design industry, if you go out there and look at a bunch of interior design websites, I would say the biggest problem is not, you know, the wrong messaging. It's a lack of messaging. Yeah, I, like no other industry. Which is wrong messaging. <laughs> which is which is wrong messaging. You're right. Um, so like, I mean, like out of every industry that I've probably looked at, like, I mean, for some reason with interior designers, there's this thing where we put up one large image on the homepage and literally write no other words. And like, you know, our, we're not saying anything, not even where are we service, nothing. And that happens a lot. And, the, you know, there's a lot of like sort of generic, you know, I mean, it, it just, there, there's a need, there's a need to say something, to, to be clear about, you know, what can I do for you as compared to this other interior designer who you are looking at? One of the things I usually tell my clients is if you don't write the story, they will. Oh, so, totally. Yes. Right? You have, yes. You have a brand. It is out there in the world. It is inconsistent. Maybe it is, you know, you don't even, you might not even realize what it is, but yes, someone else is creating the narrative for you if you do not take control of it. Exactly. And this is the same thing with our financials. If we don't write the story of our financials, some, something else will. Mm -hmm. So tell us, Nicole, what is a brand? What does that really mean? How do you explain that to those that you serve? Um, well, you know, I really like the word I just said, narrative. Um, mm -hmm. It's the narrative in people's minds about your business. You know, it is, you are the interior design firm who blank, you know, it is the shape of your, of your services, of your business in people's heads. I think that's a nice, clear way to explain it. There are a lot of quotes that you can, you know, read out there, like, um, one that I use on and talks a lot is uh, branding is the business of finding and celebrating the most interesting truth about a good or service in a way that the world won't hate, you know, like finding what is interesting and true about your business. Or um, I always quote Dolly Parton, find out who you are and do it on purpose. She said that. I love it. Um, she's not talking about branding necessarily, but I think she really is. But it is, right. Yeah. And what I like about that in particular is something that we, this is like a thing that we really dig hard into is figuring out what your messaging is. So like, okay, we're, you know, we're going to communicate this, this, and this about, you know, what we can do for people and who we are and what we can offer and, and the outcomes. And then once you decide on that messaging, like go to town on it. So like own we, it, right? Yes, and that's my it. thing, own it. And that's yes. why I think we have to keep going back regardless of if we've say we've done it before, is it still who I am? Is it still who I want to be? Is it still the message I want to put out there? And it, it becomes this deep need to know ourselves. You, you, you mentioned a couple of times, know your business or your business. Well, our businesses in most cases are um, an extenuation of us an extension of us and we need to know who we are so that we then can know who this business is or what this business is that we're creating and then create the narrative that we want it to be. Yeah. Yeah, totally. So why do you think, um, I, I mean, I have my own ideas, but I'll ask you yours. <laughs> why do you think that is so hard? Because some people can move into this space very easily. And I have some clients, even though I don't do, I don't do branding per se, but for me, I can't help you price correctly and have the profits if we don't know who you are and who you're serving, right? Because it changes the dynamic. And so I have to dig into it. I dig into it just so they can learn to say yes and no. But I have some clients that, I mean, they are just 
they're like, you know, swimming in the deep end when we start having this conversation. And I have some that will barely put their toe in the water. They've got this block. Why do you think that block is there? Have you seen uh, with any of your clients when they first come in that it's almost like it's, it's almost like Nicole, that you're asking them to go too deep into their heart and they, they, they have a barrier. They push back some. Well, the, the way that we do it, um, either in our, so we have like a one-on-one -on -one brand discovery thing that we do. It's kind of our signature consulting thing that happens before we do any work with anyone, right? Um, and then we have also a, group, a little small group class um, where I teach people how to, how to do this. And in either case, what we do is ask a gazillion questions that we know are basically uh, have, have proven themselves to be useful in finding what I think of as like kind of like the gold nuggets, you know, the things that are like going to basically we triangulate it. We're looking for a messaging point to satisfy three things. We want it to be a point of differentiation. So is it different um, from the competitors? We want it to be desirable to a target client and we want it to be doable to the business, you know, like we want it to be something that they freaking feel like doing, you know, right. that, they, that they want to dig into. So, um, as far as encountering blocks, because we do it that way, where it's like, all right, we're going to answer a bazillion questions, right? And then we're going to look for these, these things, these little, little pieces of gold that satisfy these three requirements. I think because we take it, you know, one step at a time like that, it, it almost doesn't leave room for blocks, you know? I mean, executing right. on it is a different thing, but even that, like, we're, we're going to try and get you to, like, look at it you know, objectively and say like, okay, if I want to communicate, you know, whatever it might be, how can I make this real for people and then make a plan, you know, like, don't just like take it one step at a time. Like this is a black and white process. You're going to, or we want to communicate, you know, whatever it might be. It could be that, you know, a certain level of service or a specific target client or um, an innovative approach to like, you know, storage or, you know, like whatever it might be, expertise in a particular style and aesthetic, whatever it is. We want to then say, okay, how can we communicate this? And let's actually make da, 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 a plan. So is it going to be in our image selection? Is it going to be, yes, we're going to say it on the web copy probably, you know, not always certain messaging points. Is it that we're going to tell stories? What kind of stories can we come up with? Um, how can we select testimonials that highlight these things? So, um, so yeah, because we, because we take it one step at a time, I don't, I mean, in the end, does everyone follow through and execute on it? I guess that's where the blocks come in, but right. we, we give them the plan, <laughs> you know, right. um, there don't appear to be blocks at the time, hopefully. So, right. I understand. I have um, an online coaching system, the better business coaching system. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting is I do it the same way. I break up very little pieces and small pieces and parts to their business right. with little videos and fill in this form and fill in that form. And what they don't realize is at the end of it, it's so relational, they have a business plan. But if I sat down and said, hey, let's go build a business plan, blocks go up, it feels too formal. Now, yeah. now it's not a business plan that they are gonna take to the bank, but it is a business plan that they can, like they literally will know financial goals, what they're doing, their big goals, their marketing strategy, they'll know it all when they're done. But it's self-paced and it's very relational, it's bite-sized pieces so that you reduce the overwhelm. So is that a, do you find it to be effective, Michelle? Like, do you, yes. do you find that breaking it down does, it does, right? It yes, helps. yes. Yeah. Yeah. If I went in and said, okay, let's start building a business plan. I mean, it just, I don't even like that. It just feels too, <laughs> it feels like I'm, I'm putting it myself in this box and I got to find all these like adult words that I don't even want to have to say. I just want to say, I want to make X thousands of dollars a year. Okay. That's right. what I want to say. That sounds I want to say, here's how I'm going to go make it. Okay, cool. You know, right. I, I don't, it's got to be livable, breathable. It's got to be real and actionable. And so, you know, how many times do we know that people do some of these exercises if they're, if it's not in a way of kind of self-discovery that they do it because they had to do it. It feels like something from college. And then you put it in a binder and stick it on a shelf and say, yeah, I have a business plan, but I haven't looked at it in four years. Well, that, right. that's not helpful, you know? And so there's the action to attached valid. to it. Yeah. 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 You've got to be attached to it for sure. So, you mentioned a lot of reasons, I, even in just our organic conversation here, about why it's important to have a brand. When you've seen a brand really, really work, what happens? Like when the messaging is clear, the narrative is great, the owner of the message stands behind it, and it is on point, and it is consistent, right? What yeah. do you see the outcome of that to be? 
uh, well, their pipeline fills up, first of all. <laughs> um, but, you know, and that's also having to do with like driving traffic so that people like understand that the brand exists and then they can, you know, be, be uh, influenced by how fabulous it is. But um, what, what happens is really the, the main idea here is that people, you're not a commodity. You're not a commodity. People are, are looking to, to purchase your services because they want your actual services. That's what they want. They're not comparing based on like price or, you know, some other random narrative that's in their head. So yeah, it's really powerful. And when it doesn't work or it's not there or it's broken or it's inconsistent, what happens? Well, I'll tell you, um, what, back when I first really started digging into the, the messaging and the branding aspect of this, what I saw was I was in a lot of groups, you know, like you're probably in groups online too, right? Other than I think you yes. run, run a Facebook group, but, right? But there's, you know, like on, there was one on LinkedIn that I was in where like, I felt like so much of what I was seeing was designers struggling with having their fees questioned, you know? And one of the benefits of branding is that when people hire someone who they believe, um, you know, owns something, is, is something, when they believe the narrative, when they understand the narrative about, about a business, it's not just about the marketing, you know? It's also about once you're a client, once they're a client, they feel, you know, they, they understand who they hired, you know? Like, so for example, if you have a, um, I don't know if I'm going off, off the, off the path here. <laughs> um, I just realized, but um, no, you're fine. It's okay. almost like saying they don't feel like they got a bait and switch. Like yeah. I bought, well, bought one type of person that's going to come in and do this. And they, you know, they feel like they're getting what they thought they were getting. Well, yeah. And also they're comforted by it. So for example, if you, if you are known for, let's go with like a really straightforward example, like kitchen design, right? That's a very, that's an actual niche. It doesn't always, messaging does not always have to be an actual niche, but in this case, let's say that you are, and something goes wrong with the, the project. If you, if your client understands that you specialize in kitchen design, like how do you think they're going to feel when something goes wrong? Are they going to feel like, you know, pretty, pretty comfortable or like super nervous because they hired a generalist and like, they're not sure if they know how to handle this problem that just came up. If they get that, like, this is the brand and this is, they are known for this and I am comfortable with it. It is going to help the ongoing relationship as well. Right. Because to them, it, it says they've seen everything. They, they yes. know this is going to happen, you know, and I will say that's one of the things, even in my own branding that, that has been great when people call me, because I, I'm just going to be, you know, straight up honest, people that are making millions of dollars and keeping millions of dollars in their pocket are not the ones calling me, right? Mm -hmm. They're just not. Right. The ones that are calling me are the ones that are looking to do something differently, either get started or they are just looking to have a different outcome or understanding than what they have coming in. And so when they come in, there's this trepidation of I'm showing you my books, which is literally like showing somebody into your underwear drawer, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I, I get yeah. it. I know. And, and I don't want you all looking in my underwear drawer. So I completely understand. I do think that it's interesting that when they come to me, they're embarrassed. And I'm like, you know what? Cut out with the embarrassment. I can promise you, you are not alone in this. I have seen this a hundred times and there's a way out of it and just me being able to say that not because I'm lying to them but because I've truly seen it hundreds yes. of times I've seen it I've done it I've looked at it and there is a comfort to them that that they're not showing me something that I'm like oh my gosh this is a financial thing I've never seen in all my life that I'm right. not saying it couldn't happen but I'm saying it hasn't happened yet Right. No, they are, they are comfortably, uh, you know, like nurtured in the, in the warm hug of the fact that you deal with interior designers of the same sort of like, you know, size and level of experience and yeah, they, and they struggle and right? struggle and struggle on same pain points and yes. that is comforting to them. Absolutely. If you, if you were known for not known for, if you just served like all different size clients in all different industries, that same comfort would not be there. No. Right. I, I would agree with that. And so, you know, hiring people that have their branding on point. I, I love that. I don't know that I had ever thought about it in quite those terms of how comforting. I mean, I knew that I provided comfort on my side, but really it, it is when I stop and think back of those that I've hired, like I'll, I'll put it to you this way. I even, for the most part, I only go to specialists for doctors. 
I oh, don't go oh to God. generalist. That is my favorite comparison, Michelle. Is it really? Okay. Yes. I, I have multiple autoimmune issues. I've had bypass surgery in my arm. So I've got some, you know, some different health things that are pretty, it's not an average. I don't get the sniffly cold. And when I do get a sniffly cold, I've got four underlying things that come into play. And so there are times that I go to somebody who needs to be able to look at my entire body. But the rest of the time, I'm going to somebody who's focused on my lungs, you know, on my diabetes, you know, on whatever issue, my, you know, neurologist, whatever it is that I'm going to see, I'm going to see specialist. And I have comfort in that, that I'm not the only one they've ever seen with this. Right. And they can, and they can dig in. They're not wide. They're deep. Right. They're, and they're not trying to say, now tell me again about your body. Like what? <laughs> Let me go research that because I've never seen that before. I know my husband had his, had his ears, the inside of his ears basically re rebuilt by this guy. He's the only one on the East coast that does it, you know? Wow. And yeah. And he can hear because of it. And it's, um, I mean, that can Gosh, I'm getting emotional thinking about that doctor <laughs> and and how grateful I am that he specializes and is the only one on the East Coast that does that surgery. You know, it's yeah, it's really something. But don't you don't you think our clients, when our branding is on point mm -hmm. and they have selected us to work with and we have selected them to work with, right? Because it it goes both directions, bi-directional there, that they feel that same kind of emotion when they look at their space and when they know what it looked like before or how they felt before it, it evokes that same emotion when they hire that right designer. Oh gosh, for sure. I mean, this is part of the reason why I love working with interior designers because they really, what they do, I mean, it, it affects your life every day, every day. It affects your life. Yeah. It's, it's huge. I'm sure, I'm sure it's an emotional thing for them. Yeah, absolutely. That and I just that's why I love the whole interior design industry. Like all the artisans, you know, the upholsters, the workrooms, the craftsmen, the mm -hmm. people that are making all these things so that the designers can design all these things and together they work as a team to change the way people view their homes and the spaces where they work. And there's huge value in that, huge value. And so it is so important that we brand what we do correctly, we price it correctly so that we can be profitable. You, you made a comment earlier when we started talking about where I kind of threw the bait and switch comment in there. What, what about a brand impacts a reputation? How, how do those fit together? Um, so technically there is a, uh, a subtle difference in, in you, know, you know, the terminology for this stuff. There's a subtle difference between, at the large scale, between brand and reputation. So brand, again, at the large scale, is the perception of a company's like services and how they help the person who has the perception, you know? Um, whereas reputation is technically the perception of a company's sort of like corporate behavior, you know? Like I've seen it explained as like, are they good guys or bad guys type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, right. So uh, the example that I've seen that I like is uh, when BP spilled oil in the Gulf of Mexico, their reputation was, you know, rightfully kind of shot. Um, but their gas didn't change the actual product and their brand survived it. They survived. Um, but for small businesses, like most interior design firms, I think it all comes together. You know, to me, brand and reputation are basically the same. And I think it's a, it's a real, you know, at this scale. And I think it's a really clear way to understand branding is to think of it as the reputation of your business. Okay. Yeah. They're, they're it's one of those things that there is a subtle difference, but it is very difficult to break them apart a lot of times. At, at this size, I don't think there's any point. Honestly, that's my right. opinion. Like, why? You know, we're not talking about a huge corporation. So, when's the perfect time to craft a brand? If it's this important, when's the perfect time? And, and is it too late now if we've been in business for 10 years? <sighs> yes, it's too late. Just kidding. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I get the same question. It's too late to look at my financials. I'm like, if you're still in business, it's not too late. <laughs> right, right. It's never too late to do right. it better. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's a re called a rebrand, y'all. <laughs> um, it's just, you know, whenever whenever you get to it. I mean, the fact of the matter is that it's, it's never too late. And um, also, the longer a brand is established, the more real it becomes in people's minds. You know, the more the longer a visual brand is established, the more recognizable it becomes in people's minds. So that's great, right? Knowing that, so just start taking control of it as soon as you are able to, because the sooner you start, the better. But of course, it's never too late. Not at all. 
And if you're starting your business, it's really a great exercise to begin with to be oh, able yeah. to craft, as you said, your digital destination. <laughs> I <laughs> that love that. Compass? No, <laughs> I'm going to be using that all the time now in all of my conversations. I'm going to say, I'm going to step change it to your financial destination. Oh, where's that? Ooh, I like it. I know. <laughs> I think that's why I do these podcasts. It enhances my business just as much as right. everybody else. Oh, I know. It must be fun. Oh. You get so much input. Right. But you know, just really thinking about all of this, starting at the very beginning so that you start with a plan and then you build on it so that you're not in five, seven years having to rebrand and going in a complete 180. You know, sometimes rebranding is subtle. Sometimes it's, yes. it, it and, and those happen very organically all the time. I mean, I've had my same Scarlet Thread logo for the most part, the base of it since 2003. And it was Scarlet Thread Interiors. I had a needle through it. And when I moved over to consulting, I took the needle out, changed interiors to consulting because everybody knew my brand. And I loved mm -hmm. my logo. I loved it. It's, I spent three months having my logo designed, right? And I did all the work behind it. And so it wasn't something I wanted to give up. So I tweaked it, right? So I kind of had the rebrand for the next thing. But I know I've worked with a couple of people that went and got some cheap branding. I mean, I hate to even say that, like they went out on an online service or they went in and just started pulling some things together and they literally hated the logo that they'd been using so much that they didn't use it on their marketing. And that should be a big flag. If you don't like your logo, if you don't like your branding, if you have a tagline that you don't like, if there's anything about it that you feel embarrassed in any way to put it out there and do what we talked about earlier, owning it and, you know, driving it and having that consistent messaging, that should be a huge flag that it's time to do a rebrand. Absolutely. I mean, that's a great, that's a, even for websites, people, that is a reason that it, it's not like there are obviously other needs that come up, many of them, but oftentimes that's an impetus for people to come to us for a new website, you know, or, or a new logo or whatever it may be. That being said, I, um, you know, yes, that is a great reason. To get to get a new logo if, if it's stopping you from marketing and branding your business properly then that's obviously a huge red flag um but i will say that for us to, to your point about keeping the scarlet thread logo that you had we are very conservative about changing people's logos you know like if there is recognition built around something visual then that is i mean that's basically like you know it's it's worth literally money <laughs> the recognition yes. you know like we don't we don't just do do that really nilly change that willy nilly um but yeah, right every three years we just change it based on the color that's of the day right you don't oh gosh there there are people um out in the world not necessarily in the interior design industry wherever um doing that absolutely and mm -hmm. it's a shame yeah. It's confusing. It is very mm -hmm. confusing and, and not a great idea. But but I do just want to drive home the point. If you are kind of embarrassed to to yes. you know send somebody to your website, if you feel it's outdated, mm -hmm. if you are embarrassed to I always said if I'm not willing to take a logo and put it on a shirt mm -hmm. and wear it or on a hat and wear it, I've got a problem with that logo. Mm -hmm. And so you really have got to I want my clients, I want you to love it. I want you to love it so much that it's like showing off baby pictures. Like you want to share it with the world. Like look at my pictures, right? I don't want you to be obnoxious, but you want to, you want to be able to put it out there as an extension of your business. And so just know that if you are not comfortable, you need, you need to get help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's never too late. We'll go back to it. Never too late. Nope. So one size doesn't fit all, right? I hate those clothes that say that when you know it's just not true, so don't even. <laughs> but um, one size doesn't fit all. And so if somebody is really trying to think about, you said earlier, em embracing specificity, niche, mm -hmm. right? And, and people quite often think they don't know what they're great at, right? They don't know what makes them unique. And one of the things that I know I try to help my clients understand, realize, explore, is that they are unique because they're them. Mm. And I think we miss that piece sometimes. We think that we have to be unique because, well, I can't say that my stitches is, are better than somebody else's stitching or that my design's better than somebody. That's not what this is about. This is about the way each person or business 
sees the world and interacts with their surroundings and with their resources. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. for some, it could be a thought that makes them different. For others, it could be the way they put things together. I just want you to talk a little bit because to me, it is a much broader, deeper, wider conversation than you've got to find something that in the workplace you absolutely do better. Like I put kitchen sinks in better than, some, I mean that, you know what I'm saying? They're I searching do. for this hard thing when really in most cases is something that's coming from them. It can be exactly. So um, yes. And, and it doesn't have to be a niche, you know, it can be any other, any other type of messaging points, you know, related to, as you said, it could be that they're, uh, that it's just legitimately fun to work with them. Right. Now, that's, exa that's exactly the type of messaging point where, um, you know, like we would come up with messaging points for the client or help with them come up with them. And then, like that one is probably not one that we're going to put in the copy on the website. It's going to be one that we demonstrate more, right? So it's not that it's like, we are the most fun to work with because that is, I don't know, a little corny to say yeah, it, right? It's cheesy. Um, but it's if you cheesy. say, but, but you could use things like, you know, do you want a pro the process to be fun and exciting? Then we're the ones for, you know what I mean? Yeah. And that, well, you can do that. And then also you can just make it real for people. So that what I would suggest to that person who is, who was like, you know what, this is definitely a messaging point. This is a reason why people would work with us as opposed to X, Y, and Z competitor. I would say to them, you know what, maybe you should be uh, demonstrating that it's fun to work with you in video and maybe right. you should be telling stories and maybe you should be looking at your systems. This is my favorite part of branding is looking at your systems and saying, okay, this is our messaging point. Now, how can we make that sure that this is consistently happening? If we're going to say that we are fun to work with, are there any places in our, even in our task list on this project, our all projects, right? A standard project where we can inject fun and make sure that it consistently happens every time. Oh, I love that. I love that. Perfect. Perfect. So Nicole, if you could offer one piece of advice, goodness, we've given a whole list of advice, right? <laughs> we would like, like just run off with advice on this one. But if you could offer one piece of advice to people in the interior design industry so that they could be more careful and profitable in their branding, what would it be? Um, I would say just don't be afraid to, to make a statement, to say things, to, to be something, to make a declarative sentence. <laughs> Just don't, don't be afraid. Sit, stand for something. And don't be afraid to push away the clients who are not good for you by doing that. I always say, if, if you can, I love how you said, don't be afraid to stand for something and, and don't worry if clients kind of, you know, you push them away. I always say, let the client self edit their way out. Mm. Right. Yeah. Give so them, the, give them the data that they need. Give to them do. the data they need to pull yeah. themselves out. Yes. It's kind of like when you look at a job description and it says you need 15 years in the industry and you've been in the industry for six months. You kind of, if you're smart, you self edit out of that. Right. And you go, I, that is, you know, within a year or so you might push it a little, you know, if you're at 14 years, you might be like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and try. But at six months and you need 15 years experience, you're going to self edit. So as much as we can do that, because a lot of a lot of us feel very we want to help we're in this business to help people right you know, whether it's you with the branding me with the financial and business understanding or our interior designers and workrooms with their craft we're here to help so then to have to tell someone you cannot help them is um it's difficult it's yeah. difficult yeah and it makes you feel bad you don't you don't want to do that so anything that you can give in your messaging that helps them remove themselves keeps you from having to say no. Mm -hmm. And we have to learn to say no, but it's so much better when they say no themselves. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So what's one of your next big profit goals in your business? Um, so right now, well, I think I want to read profit first. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you, I'll send you the book or I'll bring, if I, I'll, I'll mail you one. Oh my God, stop it. That's amazing. Um, yeah, you send yeah, me your address. I'll mail you one. So yeah, we were just talking before about a, a mutual uh, friend <laughs> or someone that we had both met or you know her well. Um, so yeah, I just keep hearing about profit first everywhere. Um, but we specifically right now, we are trying to, um, we're really looking at our time tracking for our flat fee projects. Mm -hmm. um, we're implementing, um, you know, monthly reporting on that for ourselves so that we can like just really get a better sense of what's happening to, to 
really you know, just keep track of things better um, and understand where we, are, where we are. And then we are also looking at ways to um, bring a little bit more automation to projects, um, just in places that are repeatable. And uh, we are looking at ways to edit so that we are just more tight about that because we tend to just like, just give and add and- <laughs> Right, scope creep. Yep, yep, um, just because that is just how we, how we tend to roll, but uh, we're just trying to be like more, more tightly edited with things, so. That, that's beautiful. That's the same kind of things, you know, that any of us have to do, regardless of our industry, is really stop and, and think about where can we make things repeatable and automate them, which reduces the amount of time and energy we put into it so that we can spend our time and energy working on those things that are going to bring money in and that are, you know, kind of uh, more important, if you will, higher level work. Yeah. And the, and I mean, the, fact, the work doesn't need to be done. It's just, right. you've got to say the same thing 45 times, put it in an email and let it say it for you. Oh yeah. And totally. And the, the fun part about that is that a lot of times when you're automating things like that, you are literally making the experience better for the other person anyway, because you're creating this like beautiful branded consistent experience that you might not be if you are, you know, if things are sort of une unevenly delivered. So I love it. So Nicole, where can people find you? Uh, people can find me at curioelectro.com, C-U-R-I-O-E-L-E-C-T-R-O.com. And, uh, and that's what they can, that's what they can do. <laughs> and you have a special offer. And Instagram too. Yeah. Um, Instagram. Yes. And I'll put all that in the show notes so everybody will have access to it. But you had a special offer for our listeners today. What was that? Did you have a, a landing page? Oh, yeah. You know, I was just saying uh, before that we do have a, uh, a download, um, a guide to defining your brand voice. So we talked a little bit about brand voice today, and it certainly relates to our conversation. But it's like a, a little recipe that we've put together for figuring out how to define your tone and your person personality as a business. So not, not what you say, but how you say it. And um, it talks a lot about the importance of consistency around that and all the little important crevices and places where your brand voice um, needs to be consistent that we sometimes forget. And what is the URL for that? Oh, thank you, Michelle. Um, <laughs> it is, it is curioelectro.com forward slash voice. Beautiful, beautiful. Nicole, thank you so much. I'm excited to get thank to meet you, you shortly. I know. And I know, and I'm excited to um, be able to share the co-authorship of a book with you. And so I want to invite everybody listening again to join us at Luann Live. It's about the conversation, which is, I think, March the 30th to April the 1st in Short Hills, New Jersey. And then also to buy the book because there's all kinds of great information in there. So, um, Nicole, thank you for being with us. Thank and, you so much, Michelle. And, and make sure you keep me updated on your Profit First journey. <laughs> thank you. I will. Uh, thanks, everybody. Bye. That was such a fun conversation. I, I can't even hardly imagine two and a half days of this type of interaction among experts and designers at Luann Nagara Live. It's about the conversation, but that is exactly what we're going to have. We're going to be meeting up March the 30th through April 1st in Short Hills, New Jersey. Trust me, you don't want to miss it. And if you're interested in those details, you can find them on my website, scarletthreadconsulting.com in the header at the top. And while you're there, click on the, the purple bar at the very tip top of my website and take your financial health checkup. One of the questions asks if everything in your business is in alignment for the profit that you wanna make. And I wanna encourage you to go back and look at that with your branding in mind. Um, really think about that. Does your branding support the profit that you wanna make? Does it tell the story you want to tell. And you know, if not, the, the beautiful time to change that is now. So it's not too late. Thanks for listening in. And always remember, profit doesn't happen by accident.